Thank you very much, Dr. Emmers. It's my great pleasure to be back in Singapore. It's always a delight to be here. Uh, this is the only part of the world I know where people can afford to spend $90,000 in order to get a permit to buy a $50,000 car. Uh, I have not yet negotiated the terms of my visit here, so I'm keeping that as the standard by which I hope to, um, to advance my honorarium. I should also note that the three talks that I'm giving uh, will include a discussion of the U.S. pivot to East Asia, uh, which will be tomorrow, and then next week, as Dr. Emmers mentioned, a comparison of the two financial crises and how Asia dealt with both of those or prevailed in both of those. And for those who are interested, there's a special discount rate of all three lectures for the same price as one, so uh, you can sign up for all three and enjoy it. What I want to do today is talk, as uh, the topic suggests, about the economic security nexus in East Asia. Um, most of the slides will be a little bit more legible than this. This one was jammed f full, but basically the starting point for this topic is essentially the fact that there has been historically a long debate about the relationships between economic connections and security. On the one hand, there is what you might think of and what's typically identified as a neoliberal school or an institutionalist school that essentially says countries that trade and interact with each other closely on economic terms will be less likely to engage in wars with one another, less likely to engage in conflicts. They will realize their mutual benefit from trade, foreign direct investment, economic interdependence. And similarly, the institutionalists will argue that as countries join common institutions to deal with common problems, they will learn to cooperate with each other. And therefore, from that perspective as well, the probabilities of conflict between country A, country B, and country C will go down. So on the one hand, you have this combined picture a lot more nuance for those of you who have international relations careers ahead of you for the next two or three years. Uh, this is not the end of the story. But essentially, both of these schools argue that there are lots of ways in which international relations can and should be positive sum. That is, we, get, we can all get more out of this if we cooperate than if we engage in conflict. The contrast to this is what's frequently known as the realist or neorealist school of thought which essentially says the world is anarchic. There is no one or there is no court that can enforce rules and standards. Therefore, countries are essentially at risk of having to compete one with the other. And because the world is anarchic, you cannot trust your neighbors. And the only way that peace can prevail is either if one country is so hegemonic or strong that it can force the others to behave themselves uh, like your mother used to do to you, or conversely, if there is somehow a balance of power so that two or three powers balance off another three or four, and each one, uh, each alliance, each cooperative arrangement feels sufficiently threatened by the other and sufficiently safe in their relationships so that, again, peace prevails. But for the most part, this is what you might think of as a zero-sum game. My advance as a country comes at your expense. My security comes at, your, at the expense of your security. So this is a very different perspective in which tensions, conflict are inevitably around the corner. The real problem that I see is that both of these make a lot of sense theoretically, but they become provable only by virtue of post hoc analysis. You can only analyze what happened in the past so that, yes, if a war took place, you can say, well, it was because there wasn't enough economic relations or wars took place despite the fact that economic ties were strong. But it's very hard to predict how and when conflicts will break out based simply on competition with one another or economic cooperation. So the central point that I want to offer to you is that the problems in East Asia today are what you might think of less as war and more as what I'm calling coercive diplomacy. That is to say, country A's armies or militaries or navies or ships or coast guards are moved into position in order to use the military to advance 
my nation's goals at the expense of your goals, the Philippines, China, and the South China Sea, uh, the Japanese and Chinese with regard to the Senkaku Dao Yu dispute, uh, et cetera, uh, where it's not that war is breaking out, but that uh, coercive diplomacy is still there, despite a lot of economic cooperation. And that the military problem is one now of managing events to avoid problems. So there's a great premium, it seems to me, on diplomacy, on uh, trying to manage situations on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the broad starting point for what I want to say. And I want to offer you what you might think of as four broad factors to keep in mind as you think about the links between economics and security in East Asia. First, and I'll give you a lot of data to support this, East Asia, and that includes Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, are increasingly interdependent economically. A lot more trade, a lot more foreign direct investment. I'll spell it out in a little bit more detail. But we are seeing a much more interdependent East Asia than we saw three decades ago, four decades ago. Secondly, as I don't think I need to tell you if you read the papers, East Asia, but particularly Northeast Asia, is still rife with military tensions. And there are a lot of situations in which militaries are challenging one another, uh, in which trust is at, a, is at a premium and is very low in evidence. At the same time, it's important to understand that despite all of these military and security tensions, East Asia has been relatively free of overt state-to-state -state military conflicts. Northeast Asia has not had any wars since the Korean armistice in 1953. Southeast Asia, depending on how you count, has been free of war since uh, Vietnam and Cambodia's problems were resolved at the end of the 1970s, the early part of the 1980s. Again, lots of tensions, but keep in mind that we haven't seen uh, the real wars. And then a fourth problem, which complicates things even more, is that we are seeing a change in the relative balance, balance of power and influence within the region. Essentially, we are seeing the rise of China as a potential challenger, a potential uh, new power within the Asian region, but also globally. And the broad theories of international relations, particularly the neo-realist theories, essentially make the argument that whenever you have a situation in which a dominant power faces a rising power, the chances of conflict go up very dramatically. So you see Spain and Holland at war with each other, the British at war with uh, the Spaniards as Britain became more powerful, uh, Germany challenging uh, Britain in both World War I and World War II, Japan challenging the United States in the Pacific as it rose during the 1930s, 1940s, etc. So it's a kind of standard argument and one that certainly animates a great deal of the discussion about where China fits these days. Okay, let me begin with one story. This is the economic story. This is the story of peace, harmony, and uh, uh, all good things coming to everyone. Basically, East Asia, uh, the primary focus in East Asia since at least the 1980s has been on economic growth. Most of the political leaders across East Asia have given up the notion that their power will be enhanced by military force, by essentially invading their neighbors, uh, pillaging their temples, carrying off their women, uh, and carrying their gold uh, back to their home countries. Instead, they have been convinced that the best way to advance their legitimacy and their support from their populations is to enhance the overall economic strength of the country to raise the standard of living for most citizens and thereby to uh, win their support and benefit as a result. Uh, the security situation in the wake of Vietnam has helped this a lot so that as security tensions went down, and particularly as tensions went down at the end of the Cold War, it's become a lot easier for countries to say, we're no longer as threatened as we once felt we were. We're capable of cooperating with each other, focusing on economics. We don't have to put as much money, as effort, as much time and energy into the military as before. 
So, as I say, the legitimacy of leaders has, the basis for legitimacy has changed. The economic miracle uh, has swept Asia. Uh, this is a story that I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with, but just to hit a couple of the highlights, uh, Japan began its economic march forward at the end of the Korean War in the 1950s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, into the early 80s. Japan grew at a rates double that of the other advanced industrial democracies, generally 10 percent a year for the first two decades, then down to 5 percent, but still better than most of Western Europe and North America. Korea, South Korea, Taiwan followed in the same wake. Singapore, as I'm sure you know, uh, benefited from the same sort of growth. Uh, and then we had what some people refer to as the MIT economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, coming along and growing as well. Many of these countries enjoying periods of six, eight, ten years in which growth rates were seven, eight, nine percent per year. So all of these countries moved essentially from what you might think of as a reliance on military prowess and a concentration of their energies more on economic benefits creating a middle class. The big exceptions, of course, are the bookends of East Asia, North Korea and Burma, or if you prefer, Myanmar, uh, in both of which cases you had regimes that essentially abjured economic growth, focused on the strength of their militaries, created militarily dominant uh, regimes at home, and uh, very closed economies. But they were the exceptions rather than the rule. East Asia has seen a huge jump in its share of world markets. 1960, Asia garnered up about 4 percent of the world GDP. Today it's up to about 30 percent of world GDP. This came about largely through increased shares of exports. I mentioned growth rates of 8 to 10 percent. Uh, again, a story that I think you're very well familiar with. And of course, you can trop through the uh, airport bookstalls uh, and see lots of titles devoted to how the 21st century belongs to East Asia or will belong to East Asia. This is just one simple graphic. There are plenty of these around. But what you see over a period of uh, 40 years, essentially, is a relative decline in the world shares of what some refer to as the EU-15, essentially the old Western Europe, the richer countries of, of Europe, uh, a relatively uh, recent decline in the prowess of the United States, and contrastingly, a big jump in the share of world GDP by Asia, Oceania, uh, and Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa basically flat uh, over this 40-year period. So that is a major story. How has this come about? Remember, we're still talking about the economic success story in East Asia. One way that the business people talk about it is through the development of value chains, essentially the ability to add value to product by uh, moving the factory rather than uh, moving the product rather than the factory. So with the development of enhanced communication across East Asia and the improvement of communication, pieces of things can move from Thailand to Malaysia to South Korea to China uh, and eventually uh, be assembled in China and shipped off somewhere else instead of being having a whole item manufactured in one country. Uh, take advantage of local strengths. If Singapore has multilingual, uh, very talented middle class populations, this provides numerous engineers, secretarial staff, administrators and the like for global companies. They may set up their headquarters here, but Malaysia right across the border may provide much cheaper labor, or uh, Thailand may do the same. Uh, it may be possible, for example, to pick up products from Indonesia that are going to be linked to the forest and uh, rubber products in those areas, and you may decide if you're an auto manufacturer to make your tires in Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. So you move the product, not the factory. A different way that people talk about this is regional production chains, but essentially it's the same story. You make different parts of a complicated item within different countries to take advantage of natural assets, natural resources, natural uh, uh, heterogeneous qualities in those markets, and then bring them together and assemble them to take the best advantage possible of uh, regional divisions of labor. I'm going to be talking heavily about Northeast Asia, but the story is very similar in Southeast Asia. This is just one graphic that shows the tremendous increase in intra-regional trade in Northeast Asia. Essentially, Japan and China 
becoming far more dependent on one another than they used to be. Uh, it all takes place sort of in the 97, 98 period. Uh, Korea, China, also heavily interdependent, and uh, Japan, Korea, also doing the same thing. But you find the same sorts of relationships within Southeast Asia. Uh, this is trade and investment. It's just a different graphic that shows investment doing the same thing. But basically, lots of companies in one country or another are investing and trading across borders in ways that challenge the notion of national sovereignty, challenge the notion of a national economy. And so intra-Asian trade, big jump here uh, from 38.5% in 1990 to about 57% today, very similar to what you're seeing in the European Union. And we're increasingly seeing foreign direct investment expanding as the consequence of the large number of free trade agreements that many countries in East Asia are now signing. So we're seeing a proliferation of those FTAs as well. Uh, and this was my effort to uh, uh, become an artist. And I'm, it's only my son that, uh, my son is a running shoe designer for Nike. He, he knows how to do these things. He's always known, done them since he was five. I, I have to play with magic marker. But, uh, but essentially, the, uh, the story here is that you have at least two very different regional production networks. One that's concentrated in Northeast Asia, that c includes Japan, Korea, and much of, uh, includes Taiwan, and much of the east coast of China. And then you have a somewhat similar regional development process going on within Southeast Asia, uh, heavily focused on uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and of course Singapore and Hong Kong being part of that, and parts of South China are involved. And this sort of purple area is simply saying that these regions are moving constantly in to deeper regions of China and integrating what once were completely rural parts of China by taking advantage of cheaper labor there. And so progress or success, if you want, has a kind of generally westward uh, trajectory. Uh, this is a different way to look at the uh, trade networks in Southeast Asia. But uh, basically, you have a great deal of movement of goods and services uh, across all of these areas and increasing uh, need for economic cooperation. Throw into the mix uh, one more piece of this, and that is the rise of China economically. And of course, uh, I'm not going to take you through the diplomatic side of this, but Richard Nixon opening relations with China, uh, Prime Minister Tanaka from Japan doing the same thing basically ending China's material and economic isolation as part of the Cold War in the early 1970s, the mid-1970s. And in that period since 1979, when Deng Xiaoping allegedly came to Singapore and listened to Lee Kuan Yew and got the message on how one puts together a successful economic uh, pattern of development, uh, China in 1979 began economic reforms and as a consequence thereof, has enjoyed growth rates of roughly 10% per year uh, for the subsequent 30 years plus. Exports have jumped incredibly. Whoops, uh, sorry. Exports jumped incredibly from 150 billion to a trillion in just 10 years, uh, and huge trade with neighbors. Basically, China has become essentially the number one trade partner for virtually every other country within Asia. So China now. Uh, has become, in essence, the factory to the world, assembling an awful lot of manufactured goods for everywhere else. They've also managed to improve political ties with Taiwan, which they see as a renegade province, which Taiwan sees as uh, a quasi-autonomous state. I don't want to get into the problems of that, but, uh, but basically, China, Taiwan have reduced their military tensions and move toward greater economic cooperation, particularly since the success of uh, Mang Zhou, the new, pre the not new, uh, six years now as president of, uh, of Taiwan. Communications are improving, trade is improving, tourism is improving, et cetera. Uh, and uh, China has improved its links with Southeast Asia, a free trade agreement that includes what's known as an early harvest, China being very generous in allowing the export of ASEAN agricultural products, uh, normalized relations with South Korea, which of course has a very strongly anti-communist ideological perspective. Uh, 
China surpassed the U.S. as the South Korea's number one trade market, also destination for Korean foreign direct investment, number one trade partner with Japan, integration with Taiwan, as I mentioned. And I, I'm not going to pursue this unless somebody wants to, but basically a lot of their relations with North Korea have become very commercialized now. China has moved away from simply giving things to North Korea and essentially is now selling things to North Korea or is extracting things from North Korea, buying mining rights, uh, buying uh, the opportunity to sell various things in, uh, in North Korea and demanding hard currency in return. Uh, so that's in large part the economic story. So this is the evidence to suggest why East Asia should become more cooperative. They are becoming more cooperative on the economic front. The second piece of the story is uh, regional institutions. They have proliferated lots of new government to government bodies. ASEAN, of course, has been in existence since 1967 uh, and is the longest running of these bodies in Asia. But particularly since the Asian financial crisis, which uh, occurred in 1997, 98, there has been a proliferation of these new bodies. ASEAN has created the ASEAN plus three, that is to say, including Japan, South Korea, China. ASEAN plus three has also been supplemented by the East Asia Summit, otherwise known as ASEAN plus six, uh, which includes India, New Zealand, Australia, and now is the ASEAN plus eight because Russia and the United States are part of that. I hope you're all following this and you have a program uh, with all the names and numbers of all the players. Uh, Shangri-La Dialogue takes place here in Singapore. Uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum has been built up uh, in Central Asia. Russia and China cooperate with the six absolutely unpronounceable Central Asian Republic, the four Central Asian Republics in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And we've also seen a rise in free trade agreements, as I mentioned earlier. So, they're thin. Lots of people criticize them as nothing more than talking shops. <coughs> but certainly those who believe in the power of institutions uh, to create cooperation would quickly uh, underscore the fact that, uh, that this is a move in the right direction. As one of my somewhat cynical ASEAN friends um, told me at one point, there are something like 360, I don't know, you may have a number, uh, ASEAN-related meetings across Asia Close to 1,000. OK. I, this was last week that I checked. They proliferate. They're like mushrooms. Uh, but, uh, but he said, you know, one of, the, one of the good things about all of these meetings is that uh, it means that most of our officials are usually on planes flying from one country to another. And that gives them very little time to sit down and plan wars with each other. So uh, if nothing else, this is a step in the right direction. We also had China uh, pursuing what many called a charm offensive pushing out Chinese products and trying to present China's rise as a very positive attribute for the rest of the region. Japan has pursued, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, J-pop and uh, a cool Japan. Um, <laughs> take it if you like it. I don't know. But it's pervasive across East Asia. Um, I'm sure many of you, um, Particularly the, uh, the females in the crowd, at least uh, at one time in your lives, bought white socks with Hello Kitty on it uh, or whatever. Um, some of you may know that some of the relations between South Korea and Japan have been softened by the prevalence of South Korean dramas in Japan. And lots of uh, Japanese women in their middle ages are following around uh, Yon-sama, the hero in um, uh, Summer Serenade. Um, and uh, in ASEAN, you have this uh, youth cultural forum, which takes place at um, uh, NUS, uh, which brings together young people, et cetera. The ultimate point behind this is simply to say a lot of intra-Asian cultural exchanges are taking place. So the cumulative picture, before I get to this uh, more depressing comment, uh, is that there are lots of reasons to think that Asia should be ready for cooperation. You know, it's becoming more economically interdependent. It's becoming more involved in cooperative institutions. It's sharing cultural attributes in ways that maybe reduce some of the otherwise sharp tensions or sharp national differences. If you're wearing Hello Kitty socks, it's kind of hard to uh, blow up the, your neighbor wearing Hello Kitty socks. 
Um, so that's the, you know, that's the bottom line picture of this. I don't know, maybe you could, I don't know. Uh, okay, so war may be economically irrational, it may be institutionally irrational, but there are still lots of security tensions. And just to hit a couple of the high points on this, the Korean Peninsula, North Korea, obviously a problem. Taiwan, PRC, sovereignty issues are still very prevalent despite the cooperation. The PRC wants to make sure that Taiwan doesn't become too independent. Taiwan is doing everything it can to try to maintain its autonomy and, and the like. There are contested territorial issues of sovereignty. Uh, the South China Seas, the East China Seas, uh, in uh, off the north coast of uh, Japan, uh, Russia and Japan have security tensions. Uh, China has periodically announced that uh, Korea really was always part of China from the get-go, and uh, this scares the bejeebers out of a number of South Koreans, etc. cetera. Uh, there is a legacy of history that uh, returns many of these countries to histories that involve a lot of xenophobia, a lot of nationalism, a lot of opposition to the guys across the border, uh, whether you're talking about Malaysia, Thailand, whether you're talking about Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, whether you're talking about Singapore, Malaysia, whether you're talking about Japan, Korea, et cetera. So as I uh, suggest here, this is, you know, this is not kumbaya. This is not uh, uh, one world uh, coming together. There are lots of places and situations in which it's clear that the national leaders and in many cases the populace don't like the neighbors. So there's lots of reason for thinking about this as a zero-sum game. And to steal a phrase from uh, my friend Miles Kaler, his comment is, if there is peace in Asia, it's the peace of the prudent. You know, we don't want to go to, we don't want to get involved with conflicts with each other because we're cautious, we're careful, you know, we're not reckless, but it's not like we love each other, okay? Um, so this is still, Northeast Asia is still the cockpit of great power rivalry, which is a phrase that uh, was around for a long period of time. And a central point that I want to underscore for you is the importance of what you might think of as endogenous threats. East Asia is not worried about anybody attacking from the outside, unlike, let's say, the colonial period during the 19th century, the early 20th century, when it was Britain or France or the Dutch uh, or the Americans that were uh, the most worrisome problem. Now, all of the guns in East Asia are aimed at other East Asians, okay? And that's an important starting point. So uh, basically, a lot of these countries are nuclear powers. Many of the countries that are not nuclear powers, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, could probably become nuclear powers within a matter of six months, nine months. The usual phrase is it's just a turn of a screwdriver. That's probably a little bit oversimplified, but certainly they're not uh, far away if they wanted to be. And within Southeast Asia, you have some very serious problems with uh, cross-border terrorism, piracy issues, drugs, uh, non-traditional security, which <coughs> for those of you who are still new here at RSIS uh, will come to know is one of the hot, uh, hot uh, items that are strengths of RSIS, uh, these non-traditional security issues involving pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so let me say a couple of things about a couple of these places just to uh, scare the bejeebers out of you and uh, make sure that you uh, pay attention to your military leaders when they, uh, when they speak about the dangers that they face. Uh, North Korea, clearly a military glorification. Um, I collect lots of these pictures, but um, none of this is going to be very surprising to you. Um, uh, the Japanese Coast Guard sunk a uh, North Korean spy ship. It's now in a museum in downtown Tokyo filled with lots of signs saying, you know, look at, you know, the horrible things that the North Koreans were trying to do, and, you know, we blew them up, but uh, they, they're right around the corner and, uh, and getting worried. Uh, North Korea is, of course, a very, very backward economy. Um, many of you have seen this iconic shot of uh, the satellite photo from outer space showing all the lights in, um, in Japan, South Korea, along the coast in China. Here's Taiwan. Here's North Korea. It's basically a black hole. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, can, I can reconfirm this. Uh, uh, I was in North Korea in, in, uh, in 2000, um, 2009. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a daily runner as uh, a few of my academic friends know. Uh, I had to negotiate with the North Koreans to go out and run in the morning, uh, and they followed me in a car to make sure that I didn't talk to anybody or do anything serious. But, uh, but it was absolutely pitch black at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, 
no light from the, the windows of buildings, no street lights, uh, no cars on the street with lights, et cetera. So, you know, running down the street, you just sort of would have to watch for pedestrians, all of whom seem to be wearing very dark clothing, and, uh, you know, their heads were down, so you could only see the tops of their heads, and, uh, you know, so it, it, that is a real picture. Uh, North Korea has been very provocative. Uh, just quick history, sinking of the uh, South Korean ship, the Chonan. Still subject to some debate, but uh, not by too many folks. It seems pretty clear that it was a North Korean activity. Uh, shelling the Yongpyon Island uh, again in 2010. Uh, a couple of people died, uh, civilians died. And uh, North Korea seems still to be playing this game of we've got nuclear weapons and so you should give us assistance. And uh, uh, this was one picture of um, uh, Kim Jong-il, the prior ruler. And we seem to be getting a similar line from his son, Kim Jong-un, um, what uh, some of the, some of the uh, Chinese cynics are referring to as uh, chubby three. Um, uh, but a third nuclear test, uh, successor of, uh, you know, a hard line. And he clearly needs the support of the military. And it doesn't seem like there's much of a way to get North Korea into this broader picture of economic development, cooperation, regional institutions, although we do have the Dennis Rodman initiative that took place a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the PRC, which had all of this story of peaceful rise, charm offensive, has in the last couple of years seemingly moved in the direction of steady increases in its military spending, <clears throat> also uh, building up military uh, assets, particularly missiles, across from Taiwan. Very close to North Korea still, although the last couple of months that may be changing, but for the longest period, uh, China was not willing to condemn North Korean military provocations uh, toward the south. And uh, uh, the biggest uh, worry, it seems, is that China seems to be using its military to enhance its regional influence. And we've seen uh, the Chinese military buildup being used in areas like the South China Seas and the East China Seas to uh, become a bit more provocative or a bit more assertive of China's capabilities. Here's a graphic of China's rising military budget. The low figure in gray, uh, this one, this one, this one, this one, etc., are official Chinese uh, commentaries. Uh, this is the low estimates uh, that are given by CIPRI, a Swedish institute that does this thing pretty seriously, and they're quite a bit higher. And then uh, finally, you've got a high estimate uh, that, uh, you know, is, is not very clear on, where are we going? Not very clear what is happening, what, what the absolute number is, but the general direction, the general trajectory is unquestionable. China is definitely expanding its military at a very rapid pace that exceeds the pace of its overall economic development. The Chinese will argue, and they have a very good case, that we are a country that had a very unmodern military. As we modernize, as we you know, become more successful economically, it makes sense for us to have a more modern military. We are simply doing what other countries would do in a similar situation. <clears throat> Pardon me, but if on, on the other hand, you're one of the neighbors, and you suddenly think that their tanks are now bigger and better than your tanks, there's the risk of a military escalation across the region. And this uh, returns to that theme of uh, more recent assertiveness. People will argue this, but I think since 2010, what had been a 10-year period of China's peaceful rise with China emphasizing its efforts at cooperation, not wanting to scare anybody, not wanting to, thanks a lot, not wanting to, uh, not wanting to rattle the neighbors, has in fact taken a number of steps that do in fact rattle the neighbors. Uh, backing North Korea in a number of provocative actions, uh, pushing back against Japan in the Senkaku Daoyu, uh, pushing back against the Philippines, Vietnam, et cetera, in the South China Seas, uh, and uh, basically uh, this has triggered a kind of re-embrace of the United States by many countries that are worried about China. Vietnam, traditionally an enemy of China or hostile to China, has uh, become very favorable to the United States. Uh, Myanmar, Burma, 
suddenly uh, looking very much to try and get out from under what it sees as China's thumb. Uh, Singapore certainly very close to the United States. The ROK, which had at times danced much closer to China than the Americans would have liked, uh, is now America's best friend again, etc. cetera. Um, just a couple of pictures on the uh, East China Sea. Uh, this is the Senkaku or Daoyu. I mean, I take no position on whose islands these are. If you are <laughs> Chinese and favoring Daoyu, I'll do my best to balance them off. But, uh, but uh, clearly a problem. Uh, you've got Japanese Coast Guard ships turning back Taiwanese. The Taiwanese are complicating things, too, because the Taiwanese are the ones who say, it's really our islands. It's not the Chinese who have it. And the Chinese are saying, yeah, it was Taiwan's, but Ch Taiwan's part of China, so it's our islands, too. <laughs> so I mean, it, it does get to be a muddy situation. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in naval choreography, uh, this is a wonderful uh, sense of how these guys are playing tag with each other. Everyone trying to prevent, you know, the ships of the Japanese Coast Guard trying to prevent the Chinese from moving into certain areas and preventing the Taiwanese from moving in, et cetera. And uh, so we've now seen what you might think of as an uncharming China. Uh, more military, uh, domestic repression at home, um, suppression of uh, uh, Liu Xiaobo, um, this iconic photo of Tiananmen, uh, which apparently you still can't get uh, Google to pull up in, uh, in China. If you Google Tiananmen, it sort of sends your information directly to the PRC's uh, high command, and uh, your blog is shut down. Uh, and this leads into that whole question of the power transition. The power transition was one in which, for the first several years, China looked to be saying, the rules of the game are ones we can live with. We're happy. We're going to cooperate. We're going to just focus on economics. We're going to be good guys. Suddenly, in the last two or three years, there seems to be a, an exposition of a more uh, vigorous and militarily assertive China that comes in the form of uh, this, you know, uh, this notion of ending a century and a half of humiliation. For the Chinese, humiliation began with the loss of the Opium Wars and then the subsequent loss of territories to various powers, invasion eventually by uh, Japan during the 30s and 40s, long period of communist non-economic growth, the Great Leap Forward that was really a Great Leap Backward, et cetera. Now, suddenly, it looks like China is ready to take a stronger position elsewhere in the world. Uh, China is stressing uh, what are called asymmetric war capabilities. That is to say, what they call A2AD, anti-area access deniability. Uh, that is to say, we may not be able to beat the United States in a full all-out war, but we have enough missiles on our coast so that if you get too close, we can blow up your ships. So, you know, our area, our radius of self-protection expands as a result of this. And the U.S., uh, by the Chinese perspective, is depleted. It spent inordinate, inordinate resources in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then the global financial crisis came. They can't manage their money. They can't manage their military. They can't win a war. It's China's time. So this is the backdrop to this notion of a power transition. And China's rise, of course, is incredible. This little uh, blurb in red uh, is kind of an interesting notion. The increase in employment in China's modern sector, largely manufacturing, expands by about 25 million workers a year. That's the same as adding a middle-sized country to the global economy every year. So China is clearly uh, likely to rise. Meanwhile, within the region, Japan has been stuck economically for roughly 20 years. Um, I, I won't take you through all of this. Basically, Japan grew from 7% of world GDP uh, in 1970 to 18% in the early 90s, 20 years, two and a half times its share. It's now back to where it was after 20 years. It's back to where it was in the 1970s. So you've got a shrinking economic uh, Japan. Here is the trajectory of Japanese and Chinese GDP. And you see that China begins to pass Japan over the last uh, four or five years. So China is feeling very good within the region. Countries that once looked to Japan as possibly a source of support, assistance, technological aid, 
are looking at the tea leaves and saying, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who's the power going to be in Asia? It sure looks like China. It doesn't look like Japan. They may have, you know, they may have a, you know, better road system or they may have a better rail system, but all things considered, China looks like it's clearly going to be the uh, power to watch. And Japan has not helped its situation within the rest of Asia because of its pursuit of uh, various historical issues, denial of history as the, uh, the rest of Asia might see it. The Asakuni Shrine, as I'm sure you know, is at the heart of this. Um, it's always a um, turnout spot for old veterans. All these crusty old guys come out, march around, blow their bugles, uh, salute each other uh, manically, et cetera. But importantly, and, and it's very less frequently mentioned in the press, is that right next to the Yasukuni Shrine is um, the Yushukan Museum, which is a Japanese version of the history of World War II, the essence of which is the devil made me do it. You know, we were just sitting here being peaceful, and next thing you know, god damn, they blew up Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, you know, uh, it was the ABCD powers, you know, uh, America, Britain, China, and the Dutch that were surrounding Japan. Uh, the Chinese couldn't get their act together. The Koreans were all screwed up. You know, we had no choice but to step in and try and bring order to this. Otherwise, the whites would have dominated the yellows, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so it's a, you know, a very laudatory history of uh, the Japanese zero, Japanese successes across the, uh, the war, the horrors that uh, Japan suffered at, at the hands of the Americans, et cetera. And of course, Prime Minister Koizumi has visited Yasukuni Shrine. That led to a deterioration in relations between Japan and um, China. And a big worry is current Prime Minister Abe here visiting the shrine, but not in his capacity as Prime Minister. But the worry is, will Abe do this again, and will that lead to a further deterioration? Uh, whenever you know um, situations get bad between Japan and China, China unleashes a whole host of uh, anti-Japanese demonstrations within the within their country. Uh, the last time I checked, it was something like $100 million in Japanese property was destroyed uh, in you know a matter of uh, several weeks of anti-Japanese riots. And uh, for those of you who are South Park fans, uh, oh good, there are a few in the crowd that recognize this. Uh, South Park uh, uh, epitomized this with the, uh, a competition of uh, two restaurants opening up in uh, in their uh, backdrop city, um, City Walk, Chinese, uh, was going to be challenged by um, City Sushi. Uh, and of course, in, the, uh, in South Park's lovely transla transliteration of Asian pronunciations, this turned into competition between Shitty Walk and Shitty, uh, shitty Sushi. Um, <laughs> and just to, keep you, just to let you know that I'm staying current uh, in the Asia Cup, this weekend, uh, the Japanese uh, team were playing the Koreans, and the Koreans managed to unfurl this huge banner, the essence of whoops, sorry, uh, which said, "There's no future for countries that forget the past." So, uh, so this is still a resolution of a, a, a resonance of the tensions between Japan and South Korea, as well as Japan and China. Uh, it is worth mentioning that Japan won the cup, so it may be that history belongs to the future, I don't know. Um, I would just suggest that you keep these tensions in perspective, back to the point that I was making earlier about no wars. Um, military expenditures per, as a proportion of GDP are largely going down across Asia. Partly that's a result of Asia getting richer and spending less on its military, but we're not really in the midst of an arms race, and there are lots of areas of cooperation. It is an open question as to whether the last two or three years are signaling some kind of shift or whether this is just another one of those bumps in the road. Um, but I would warn against the, the dangers of what I'm calling uh, teleological, uh, theoretical teleolo teleology. You know, the realists would say war is inevitable. The uh, neo-institutionalists would say institutional cooperation will spill over from one area to another as countries realize they have to cooperate. Both of these run the risk of, of oversimplifying the complexity of uh, choice 
the political scientists talk about this as structure versus agency. The point is somebody actually makes a decision to push a button to start a war or to blow things up or to crash his ship into yours or whatever it may be. Domestic nationalism remains high, uh, and there's a lot of course of diplomacy going on, but basically it still remains short of war. It still remains largely short of serious shooting. Uh, and so I would just, uh, in effect, close by saying the important thing is to realize that this is now a situation for political management. Smart politics can shape the future. We have the future destiny somewhat in our hands. We have the capacity, if our leaders are smart and operate with an eye toward caution, to move forward rather than backward and to avoid difficulties and, um, and confrontations. So that's um, one or two th quick, quick things on this, uh, and that is that there are still areas of cooperation, particularly among Japan, Korea, and China. The leaders meet annually for conferences. All the issues are on board. Meanwhile, uh, whether the American pivot is uh, Superman to the rescue or Super Obama to the rescue or not remains to be seen, but the United States is telegraphing very clearly that um, it is trying to rebalance itself and move toward greater engagement with Asia generally and very specifically with uh, Asian institutionalism. So the United States has done a lot of things, signing the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, creating an ambassador to ASEAN, uh, normalizing relations with uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, uh, and uh, seeking the right balance with China. Uh, this is something that I just put together recently, showing that the, the Obama pivot is to some extent real. This is the number of days spent in Asia. Instead of boots on the ground, which is the military, I've called it tasseled loafers on the ground. Uh, the diplomats getting out there and being uh, present, but Hillary Clinton uh, probably has uh, enough time in Asia to get citizenship in Singapore or uh, elsewhere. Uh, lower level officials have been even more present. I know uh, Kurt Campbell, who was Assistant Secretary of State for the Far East, had 25 secret visits to Burma, uh, and uh, Derek Mitchell had even more. So this pivot, I think, is quite real. But for the U.S., the biggest challenge remains China. And there have been, I think, a, a real deterioration in relations since 2010. So the question is, can the U.S. engage economically and create what you might think of? The, the old Cold War slogan was mutually assured destruction. My missiles will, are so bad and serious that I can blow up your missiles even if you attack us first. So we have mutually assured destruction of each other, and that will keep us peaceful with one another. And so the questions become whether you can create the conditions for mutually assured prosperity. Will TPP, et cetera, the uh, uh, regional cooperation of uh, Asia Pacific, et cetera, go forward? Uh, and you know, can Japan recover economically and play a positive role within the region? The, uh, I think the central point that has to be understood is we have to understand that China will rise, but how it rises also will require accommodation by those whose power is going to be relatively diminished. Can the United States accept a rising China so long as that China does not seriously challenge the status quo? China's going to want more power in the United Nations, more power in the IMF, more power in the um, World Bank, it's going to want more influence in developments in East Asia. Would the United States be comfortable with that or not? But clearly, the rising power problem also involves a status quo power problem. Can the status quo powers adjust adequately? So between China and Japan, I just want to underscore the fact that there are lots of areas for potential cooperation. Strategic and economic dialogue between the two goes forward every year, top-level leaders meeting. The G20 and economic cooperation is a possibility. Both sides have been cooperating to try and reduce the threat of nuclear weapons in North Korea. Uh, they cooperate on non-traditional areas of security, disease, pandemics, piracy, et cetera. They're cooperating on Muslim terrorism, Muslim fundamentalism, particularly uh, in Central Asia. And uh, 
at least potentially they have the area of cooperation with global, global climate change and a lot will depend I think on Xi Jinping and Obama's personal relationships. So finally getting to a conclusion, I think there are positive moves for Asia in the areas of economics and institutions. They should trigger more cooperation. <clears throat> All of these countries have to deal with a rising China and that's going to be a very serious problem over time and it will depend on how, the future will depend on how China rises and chooses to rise and how the rest of the region, including the United States, responds to it. But ultimately, I think the future is going to be shaped less by the absolutes of theory and more by uh, the political actions and the political processes of leaders. And so the hope lies pretty much in the capacity of leaders to find ways to cooperate and to find ways to back off from what might otherwise be conflicts that would have led um, their predecessors decades ago to perhaps start shooting at each other. So let me stop on that note and open it up for questions or reactions or comments. Thanks. Thank you.